Hello everyone, welcome to this Volvo Pain Society social media live. I'm Sharon Gorbear, Volvo Pain Society trustee, therapist and pain science educator. As always, please say hi in the comments box or chuck an emoji in there just so that I know you are watching. And any questions that come up as we go through today, uh, please pop in the comments too. Um, and keeping an eye on what's coming in is also Kay Thomas from the Vival Pain Society in the background. Uh, let me just see. Um, okay, right. So do say hi in the comments box if you're watching. I can see Kay's in the background. Um, of course, if you're watching the replay, feel free to comment too. So today we are covering a really important topic of vulval cancer, risk factors, self-examination and management. Um, hi, lovely to see you all here. Thank you for commenting. It's nice to see that I'm not on my own. Brilliant. So our guest today is our very own David Nuns. Hi, David. Hello. Hi. David, for those of you who don't know, is the founder of the Vulval Pain Society and trustee. Dr. Nunz is also the current chair of the BSSVD, the British Society for the Study of Vulval Disease. He's the clinical lead of Vulval Health, a multidisciplinary team at Nottingham University Hospitals NHS Trust. He's a consultant in gynaecology, oncology and vulval disease. Um, consultant, gynaecological oncology surgeon. Now, David, I know that you have a presentation to start off with today before we go into any questions. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, there will be some photos during this, not of vulvas, because, you know, this is streaming live to Facebook and we can't have vulvas apparently, but they're going to be pictures of other parts of the body to show you what you might be looking for. So let's see if this works. Uh, David, go for it. You can start your presentation. Um, hopefully, just people watching, just let us know that you can see it. So, David, go for it. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Sharon. And uh, I hope to cover the following uh, topics in this quite short presentations, and then we can have general chat and answer help answer your questions uh, about vulval cancer, a bit about who's at risk, and how self-examination can be of use in detecting possible vulval cancer. So my the first bit of the talk is a bit about the science and the symptoms and uh, how we investigate vulval cancer and, and treat vulval cancer. We have on average around a thousand women every year in the UK diagnosed with vulval cancer uh, who are managed in cancer centres around the UK. There's around 50, 55 cancer centres. And we, the first port of call for a, a, a patient is going to be usually the GP. And so the earliest signs and symptoms we might pick up might maybe uh, related to a, a, the development of a tumour on the skin. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute of some some cancers from other sites of the body not the vulva and you might appreciate how that we, we might pick these up uh, ourselves or, or, or how a gp might pick this up in the in the in the practice but these are skin tumors um these are uh, cancers of the skin of the vulva and this picture is uh, a picture of the vulva so this is this this just shows you the the area that of, of interest when we're thinking of vulval cancer. The vulva includes mons pubis at the top, the fatty hair bearing areas, out to the, the, the genital crural folds, we call it, where the thigh joins the outer, uh, uh, where the inner thigh joins the uh, inner aspect of the uh, vulva, the labia majora. And we do include the perineum and the anus in our definition of the vulva. So this is, this is the area that I, as a doctor, uh, would examine if someone came along with a suspected vulval cancer. And there's more more information on the vulva on, our, on the VPS website. So this is a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the lip on 
uh, a patient that I uh, found on the internet, as I can't show Volvo images on the, in this presentation. Um, and I try to think about my practice, what do I see uh, in Volvo cancer? Uh, and in my day-to-day -day practices, there's a spectrum of disease seen from very small tumors uh, to much larger tumors. Uh, so Derm dermnet.org uh, is a fantastic resource. It has lots of pictures of clinical images. Um, so I have to credit them for their, for putting all the, the images on the internet. So you can see in this picture, in the center of the, uh, of the picture, a, a lesion, something to see, uh, something visual. And that is, it looks nodular, it, look, it looks raised, um, it's red. And this to me would be very similar to a very small cancer of the vulva. And the commonest site would be the labia majora uh, and then the labia minora and the clitoris. So those are the commonest sites that this sort of lump might develop. So these are usually what we call squamous cell cancers. They're off the surface of the skin, much less common. We get melanomas, which are pigmented uh, lesions uh, uh, of the vulva, which are also cancers. And if you look at this, you particularly when this is small, you, you might understand how it might not actually give you any symptoms. It might give, it might give a little bit of itching or soreness, um, but it might actually you might actually feel this if you were putting your dermivate on, if you had lichen sclerosis or, or washing. So in the very early stages, you might not necessarily get a very clear symptom. Uh, and so this is when we come on to um, self-examination uh, later on. But you might feel a lump. So sometimes in early tumours, women feel a lump uh, or they're conscious of itching. Uh, or if this top surface breaks, uh, open then you might feel a sore. Now this next picture uh, is an, a squamous cell cancer of the lip again and I, I looked at this picture hard and I, I would say that this does look like a, a bigger cancer of the vulval skin that we do see. Squamous cell cancers it's much bigger than the one that you've seen on uh, in the other picture and if you can just imagine this this cancer on the vulva you're going to have perhaps more symptoms. So the symptoms that you might experience if somebody develops this cancer is there may be bleeding, uh, there may be a discharge, uh, there may be itching, or more often pain. So these can be these can be painful tumors. And again, if you put the finger on the area, you can imagine with this this sort of lesion that a lump would be felt. It, it would be it would not feel like normal skin. Uh, this would be something that's palpable, uh, much perhaps more obvious in this picture than in the top picture. But nevertheless, both you might uh, feel if you were practicing self-examination on a regular basis. So what you're looking, for, what we look for is, is change uh, in the usual. And that's a lot, that's often how women come to us uh, in the, oncology clinic when they develop cancer they notice a difference they know they say i found a lump can you check it out or i've i've got some itching that's not settling i've got a persistent sore and i need a checkup so these are the the symptoms the signs are what we see and uh, as you can see there they, they can be lumps they can be uh, warty type raised skin lesions but sometimes you can get ulcers and, or breaks in the skin that don't uh, heal and also skin color change, which I'll come on to. So that's a, 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 those, those are two examples of perhaps a very small squamous cell cancer of the, of, uh, of the vulva, which is on the lip and a, and a larger one. Now, what we would do to confirm the diagnosis following referral would be a small four millimeter, what I would call freckle size biopsy of the skin in the clinic uh, following referral. So we, we need a small piece of tissue to examine under the microscope just from the edge of the tumor to get histology. And that would, that ideally is carried out on the same day 
as the referral and a result is back within a week. And this would confirm the presence of cancer. And we would never diagnose vulval cancer or rarely diagnose vulval cancer without a biopsy, which is our gold standard. Now, when it comes to treatment, um, we always focus on trying to treat what's called the primary site, uh, which is the vulva, obviously, and then uh, trying to assess the potential of spread from the vulva to other sites of the body. And there's great progress been made over the years in the care of women with vulval cancer. We, we had some very difficult exam difficult treatments in the, historically for women. And now the treatments are becoming much more um, individualized and uh, less radical than previous. This, this screenshot sent, reminds me just to, to show you that some of the technology that's in, uh, progressed over recent years, the vulval cancer can spread to the lymph nodes in the groin uh, in about a third of women who need an operation. And so we would, uh, we would need to remove, or at least assess some of the lymph nodes in the groin. And hysterically, we used to take all the lymph nodes out in all the patients through two cuts in the groin, um, what we call the femoral and the deep femoral lymph nodes. Uh, and now we can, uh, with selected patients, uh, instead of taking all the lymph nodes out, which can occasionally lead to, lead to lymphedema, we can remove just the, the, what, the first lymph node in that, what we call lymphatic chain from the vulva, which is called the sentinel node. It's, some, it's a technique we use a lot in breast cancer, and we can also use this for vulval cancer. So it involves a CT scan following uh, an injection of radioactivity, and then we can see the, the, what we call the, the hot node at the time of the operation and remove this rather than all the nodes. If the lymph nodes are negative, which they are in most women with, with small vulval cancers, the success rates of treatment are incredibly high, very high. So a very curative disease in its early stages. So that's for the area of potential spread. Uh, this is following the diagnosis of vulval cancer. And with regards to the treatment of the primary tumour, uh, we do favour surgery as the best option, uh, then radiotherapy and then chemotherapy. So as the tumours, as you saw from the first pictures, can be, they, can be ulcer, they can be ulcerated, sore, uh, they can bleed, they can be painful, and occasionally can be a bit smelly as well, if they, as they're moist, then surgery is our best option because it gives us very good cure rates uh, if it's completely excised and the uh, the skin heals up very well and uh, the um, the well, patients feel much better once the uh, uh, the tumor has been removed so it's uh, although it's it's it is it is it does change the appearance of the vulva without doubt um, when a woman comes along to us with a vulval cancer she's very accepting of surgery by and large because she knows that the tumor has been removed and if the margins are clear we've got a good outcome in terms of the cancer. And this is just a, an example where we would do what's called a wide local excision, similar to wide local excision of the breast for breast cancer. Unfortunately, if the tumour is bigger and if it's involving several sites and, and the tumour is involving, for example, the clitoris, then the uh, that, that is a that's sometimes a site we see we will need to remove the vulval skin including the clitoris and uh, the perineum and the labia uh, just a word of warning with this slide it's this is from one of our patient information leaflets and it, it, it everything is individualized so this is not a generic standard operation that we offer all women we do offer women tailored surgical treatment depending on their on their cancer but the margin around the tumour is a crucial part of the surgical approach. We, um, for the majority of women, surgery is all that's needed. We do consider women for a four-week course of groin and pelvic radiotherapy 
uh, if the groin nodes are positive, that's Monday to Friday treatment uh, at the hospital, usually for four weeks. And this will uh, this uses a machine called a linear accelerator, which generates X-ray radiation beams to the groin and the pelvic lymph nodes. That's really if the lymph nodes are positive, and there's a concern about cancerous spread outside uh, the, the lymph nodes into the deeper pelvic lymph nodes. So surgery for most women in isolation, those with positive lymph nodes would get um, a course of pelvic radiotherapy and occasionally chemotherapy. In terms of referral, um, your GP is your first port of call with your concern, if there is a concern, and you wouldn't automatically go to a gynecological cancer specialist, but you would be referred on, a, no doubt, a two-week wait referral. That's when your GP fast-tracks fast tracks you to the hospital for a, um, a, a history and examination by a hospital specialist. Now, it's worth saying that of, of perhaps 100 women referred on a two-week wait or fast-track referral to the hospital for a a suspected gynecological cancer, only, well, it's not only, 5% of women will have a cancer and 95% of women won't. And with regards to vulval lesions, many of the vulval lesions that we see on this fast track pathway are not vulval cancer. In fact, the majority are not cancers. They can be, um, they can be skin lesions uh, that are benign. They can be Lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, small areas of VIN, precancerous change. So there's lots of other things that you that can cause symptoms of and signs of vulval cancer. It's not just cancer. There's in fact there's there's a there's a, a very large number of as you know vulval conditions that uh, uh, can produce symptoms uh, that I've just talked about right at the beginning: itching, soreness, and breaks in the skin. Now your GP uh, will probably refer you on a two week wait referral uh, if there's a concern. It's worth saying that the average GP sees perhaps one case of vulval cancer every probably 10 to 15 years, one GP practice that is. So it's not a common uh, cancer for a GP to easily diagnose. So they, they probably want to get that referral to the hospital so a biopsy can be considered. And that's, as I say, a gold standard. So GPs don't do vulval biopsies in the practice. So don't be alarmed if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're going on a two week referral that, uh, that, that there's highly likely to be a cancer. To be honest, the two week wait referral system is, um, it, it gets you seen very quickly. It gets you seen very quickly within two weeks uh, at the hospital by the specialist. Once seen, once seen by the specialist, the usually a general gynecologist, a biopsy is taken, and then you may get referred on if there's a cancer to the um, to the uh, gynae cancer team. In terms of who is at risk, um, it was it's it's fair to say that uh, that women with lichen sclerosis, lichen planus. VIN, which is precancerous change in the vulval skin and other, other conditions like Paget's disease, those women do have a, a, a higher than average risk of developing cancer. But that group as a whole have a 95% chance of never developing vulval cancer. Um, a 95% chance that they will not develop a vulval cancer. So it's what we call a 5% chance of, of, of developing cancer if we just turn that round. Now you might ask, well, what is my specific risk? You know, what is my exact risk? Um, and we can't easily answer that question because when we've looked at studies of lifetime risk, we group people together. We do put people together um, and we come up with this figure. And that's a, a sort of common agreement amongst medical staff that it's roughly about a 5% risk of developing cancer in the skin over what we call a lifetime. And uh, to put that into perspective, it's, for example, there's a, there's a one in three chance that 
any one of us will get a cancer, but that can be at any point in one's life. So the risk is slightly increased in those, 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 those patients. So the last part of the talk is about um, detection of vulval cancer and, and a bit about self-examination. And um, Sharon, did you want to mention this leaflet on the BSSVD website? The, the, I'll mention it then. This this is the um, this is a new leaflet produced by uh, the team in Manchester. Um, this is um, a, the research team at Manchester University and the BSSVD, and it's a colour uh, leaflet for. Uh, patients, women who are at increased risk, women with lichen sclerosis, uh, lichen planus, BIN and Paget's disease. But it's perhaps useful for all women. It's, it's quite graphic. It's got the images um, uh, in the leaflet of the various conditions. So it's, it's I think, very useful because it, it, uh, it will give you some reality as to what we're trying to, to look at. And I think that this leaflet would be very useful for medical and nursing staff as well. So that that leaflet is um, available uh, online and we can give you the link at the end. So just before I come on to self-examination, uh, um, in, in terms of how, what we're looking for as doctors and nurses at the skin, we look, well, we, it, vulval disease, skin disease is a very visual specialty. And so we are looking at the skin and trying to not make a diagnosis by by just looking at the skin we're trying to describe the lesions what we see and then put those descriptions together to make a diagnosis so very very commonly you get um aptus ulcers top right hand picture uh, these are the little uh sores that you get in your mouth they are breaks in the skin they're they're they're, they're acutely painful um you're actually you can easily see them as sort of little punched out ulcers uh in the skin breaks in the in the top uh, top couple of layers of the skin self-limiting they disappear a biopsy is not needed because they are transient the painful and the skin heals up so th those are ulcers and an erosion is just lo loss of the top layer of the skin and fissures again uh, a fissure is what it sounds like, a split in the skin, a break in the skin. And you can see this is a long-standing fissure on a finger from uh, dermatitis. So someone's got a split there in the skin. Splits on the vulva are very common and they are often very transient and heal very quickly. And so, so does little breaks in the skin, ulcers in the, on the vulva, particularly if there's lichen sclerosis or like and plainness that's flaring up, they will come and they will go uh, quite quickly with treatment. And they, they're not likely to be persistent uh, if they are, if the LS, the LP is well controlled. Uh, but the things to see with regards to colour change, then this is um, birthmarks are a good example of a very flat lesion that you can't feel. Uh, and so a macule or a, um, a patch is something a birth, is like, like a birthmark is something that we would could, can visualize but we won't feel because it, the skin the skin texture is the same so that's another common um, skin descriptor and and a lump or a nodule or a mass or a papule to the lay person it's a, it's a description of something that's to be felt and this is something palpable it might not necessarily have a color but it will be something that is felt uh, and, the, and these could be small or or large a papule is something very small less than a centimeter a nodule is something something larger so this is a picture of psoriasis and this is another way of uh, of describing skin lesions and this is what's called a plaque and this is this is not quite like a nodule or a papule, which is quite discreet, discreet, but this can be felt over a wider area, a thickening of the skin, something that is raised. And, and if, you, if you've seen psoriasis, people with psoriasis, they do have this um, quite def well-defined area of thickening raised skin. 
and and this is also something you can see on the vulva so this is another uh, another appearance or a feeling in the skin that we're, we're interested in so uh, just bear in mind the context of those uh, descriptors what we're trying to do with self-examination is we're trying to get enable the woman to develop confidence in, in examining her own vulva and it's worth saying that there is no uh, optimal uh, way of doing this we haven't shown that this technique is the best technique to do because there are so many factors that are going to influence how uh, you or an individual would examine their vulva and uh, we can't necessarily prove that self-examination leads to uh, you're a reduced chance of of developing an advanced cancer but it just makes sense uh, that we should teach patients to think about examining their vulva uh, to pick up a change uh, so that you can get that next step uh, an opinion a medical opinion uh, i guess what we're trying to do here is is through this these next series of slides is really just to give you some trying to improve your knowledge of vulval anatomy um, and from the very initial pictures of the of the picture of the vulva it's helpful to have a, a basic knowledge of your vulva in terms of the, the pubic area the labia majora minora perineum and and the anus area because that knowledge is is very helpful particularly when you begin begin examining the vulva and also knowledge of your diagnosis so if you've got VIN or lichen planus or lichen sclerosis an understanding of what that condition is and how it's managed um, in terms of skills um, again there's no everyone's different there's no uh, specific way to learn this other than making I think self-examination a habit um, to make it a routine a part of your life because i do think we can learn we can learn new skills uh, and that skill in in examination and i think that the more you do generally some aspects of self-examination the better you get at it i can't prove that but that's my gut feeling i did the clinic yesterday and um asked a few women if they were self-examining and many of them didn't quite know what to do, but would look would look if there was a problem, and and that's that's helpful, uh, I guess. But I guess you're trying to look when there's not a problem as well, so that you can be mindful of the fact that there is a problem uh, because of change. Uh, and then confidence, and this is a tricky one, isn't it? What do I feel confident in knowing when not to go and see the doctor or um, when I need to see the doctor and I, I, I think it's fair to say that confidence is a difficult one however many women who've got long-standing lichen sclerosis lichen planus VIN who have this as a what we call a chronic disease more than six months many of them do manage their own condition they're not under follow-up and they, they get very good at knowing when there's a problem so confidence again can develop with your knowledge and with your your developing your skills of examination so you know what is this this confidence is, do you help do you go and see help or do you do you just carry on and um i, I think this is a difficult one i've tried to scale that over the next few slides whether you would just keep an eye on things no medical review uh, you can monitoring, self-monitoring, and a recheck maybe three weeks later. Whether you might plan a medical review with the GP and go and get a checkup, um, or if you need to go and see a GP with a matter of urgency for a two-week wait. This this very arbitrary scoring system. So I've thought of the acronym of SAFE: um, Symptoms Assessment. Sorry, Symptoms Appearance feeling of the skin and examination and i guess what i've tried to do is put the the equal importance to the development of symptoms appearance 
and feelings of the skin together. Um, what is apparent is that some women are not able to look at the vulva uh, because of maybe their arthritis of their neck or their, their, their perhaps their size is a bit of a barrier, uh, perhaps hip problems, knee problems, these are all very common. But that's, that's fine, that is absolutely fine. Other aspects of self-examination can be thought of, including the attention to symptoms and also of, of feeling the skin. So symptoms on their own actually do not, if you've, if you've developed itching on its own, that has got a very poor predictor of vulval cancer because itching is incredibly common and it's often due to, um, it can be due to lichen, dermatitis, uh, VIN, so, and nothing to do with cancer. So it, it's perhaps persistent itching where you might want to, um, you, to get an opinion. So, so persistent itching that doesn't settle. And that the, there's a standard of care we want you to be examined with a good light by a health professional and a diagnosis made. Now, if you've got lichen sclerosis and you're on your maintenance therapy twice a week, then if you've got itching, new itching, persistent itching, you've had a look, maybe had a feel, then we're going to suggest your daily dermavate or potent steroid until it begins to settle. Uh, if it doesn't settle after about three weeks, then you were going to go and see perhaps the doctor for an opinion. Um, if you're using steroids daily anyway, and you've still got the itch, then perhaps you should go and get an opinion uh, from, from a doctor uh, and a checkup. Uh, again, just to look for uh, uh, that, to support your own confidence in, in perhaps what the diagnosis is. As much as itch can be a very unusual sign of vulval cancer, a symptom of vulval cancer, pain is probably a little bit more important. Persistent sores, cuts, burning. And again, it's the emphasis on um, the persistent symptoms. If you've got your strategy for your fissuring from lichen sclerosis or your sores and you've tried your dermavate for three weeks every day and it hasn't settled, perhaps that is worth going to see the doctor and uh, rather than monitoring. So see the doctor for an opinion rather than monitor if things don't go away after uh, perhaps your three weeks of daily dermavate. If you've got VIN, then I think you wouldn't be using steroids, so you would go and see the doctor for an opinion. And again, if you feel a lump or a nodule or a mass, you're gonna go into the doctor fairly urgently to get uh, that examination and possibly a referral. Bleeding and discharge, yeah, without a doubt, if the tube does bleed, um, if there is bleeding, you'd still need, if, if you're postmenopausal, you need to get a referral straight away, uh, uh, just for an examination. Now, the appearance of the skin is uh, is, uh, is is covered in, in the next section, really. What you're looking for is colour change. And remember, skin naturally has a... Uh, a what, what is normal for you, but it naturally has a generally a pink appearance. There's variation. Um, the vulva vestibule generally has a pink area. There's ethnic variations in color change, uh, in, in the color of the skin, but you're looking for a change. Uh, now you're looking with a mirror, a selfie stick, uh, whatever way you can do. Um, and ideally looking at the whole of the vulval skin as I showed you in the picture, starting at the mons pubis area where the hair bearing areas and working down the labia majora, clitoris, perineum and anus and separating the folds of the skin to look deep inside those folds for any change. And I think if you've noticed whiteness, skin redness or pigmentation or a change, then it's not unreasonable to, to get an opinion um, uh, from a doctor uh, uh, as to why the, that color has changed, why the, the skin has changed. If you see a lump or a nodule, yeah, that's a, a reason to go fairly quickly. You'd feel, you might feel it, but you might see something as well. And then, and then breaks in the surface of the skin, cut sores of erosions. These are all terms that we use for open skin that won't heal. So many women with LS 
and um, uh, LP can experience breaks in the skin, um, fissuring splits, but they're usually very transient and they can heal with steroids. VIN patients with VIN who scratch the area, again, it's a form of trauma. It can split the skin, but they do heal, it does heal up and things do settle down. So after three weeks, if they don't settle down or this concern, perhaps go and seek uh, an opinion. And then finally, feeling the area. Um, what you, as, as you might remember from the pictures, anything palpable that's new, um, perhaps get checked out. It doesn't have to be like in those first pictures of the lips, an obvious lump, an obvious nodule. Um, it, it could be just some raised thickening. And I think most GPs won't know what to do if it's raised thickening. They might just refer you on for a biopsy if it's a new problem. Of course, some women with lichen sclerosis and VIN, um, less lichen planus, I think, do have thickened skin, that the skin can be thick, but that's long standing and it's not, uh, not new. So that's fine and it's managed with a dermavate or it's managed by with VI and just the monitoring, but it's any new palpable change of thickness in the skin. Uh, if you feel a new lump or a nodule, yes, you're gonna to go to the hospital straight away. And then if you feel a persistent area of soreness, a, a persistent area of pain, I think that's worth noting. You might not feel a lump or a nodule you might not feel that the skin is thickened, but when you notice an area of persistent, uh, a new area of pain, should I say, on touch, and it just doesn't heal with dermavate or your emollient, then I would consider getting uh, that checked out. And yeah, th this, is, this is not a prescribed uh, performance, as you would you might suggest, but it's, uh, it's, it's routine, it's habit forming, you need your good light. You need to have this bit of framework in starting at the top and working down. And uh, this is trying to build this into your life. Um, if you want to do this or aspects of what I've said, once a month is not unreasonable. Um, men are told to examine the testicles once a month, but um, uh, examining the vulva once a month, perhaps for all women is not unreasonable. It can be more often. Uh, for some for some patients with LSLP or those who've had a history of vulval cancer. Um, it's not prescribed, but it's, it's just trying to begin a process of um, building it into a, a routine. I think the, the final thing I wanted to say, Sharon, is just the, the when I speak to women in the clinics, the, the response to self-examination is very mixed. Um, it's, it, it does fill a lot of women with fear about looking and putting a mirror or a selfie phone or something there to look at the changes um, in the skin. But, um, and that produces a, 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 an emotional response that can be very, can promote anxiety, stress, worry, fear. People can think the worse um, if they've, if, when they have a first look. I, I would say that sometimes it's helpful with a, a medic, uh, maybe at the Volvo clinic, review just to go through what they are seeing and what you as the patient might be seeing and feeling um because that's a sort of a common agreement of what the appearances and the feelings are and that that, that i find that very helpful for the patient i say well your vulva looks you've got lichen sclerosis it's very well controlled there's no cancer there's no thinning of the skin and there's no concern you've got a little mole or freckle there which you've had for for years that that can be ignored and you've got um you've got a um, um a little uh a pimple that might be a pimple from shaving or you might have had a little skin tag there for years and then you've got an understanding of where you, you might be starting off from um and i'm going to finish there sharon is that okay i'm happy to take some questions That was great, David. Um, and was I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, and I think it's uh, Kay in the background has mentioned some people may find a mirror on a stick uh, useful. 
um, or a mirror on a stick with a light useful and I think you were talking about perhaps using phone but there are ways to make that easier um, do put your questions in I'm have put a link up with the BSSVD leaflet on self-examination and we do have um, some some uh, advice on our site as well uh, there's a question here about someone who was diagnosed with a vulval cancer in 2019. It's been 17 months since a radical vulvalectomy, and I'm still on nerve pain medication and still find walking and sitting uncomfortable and also have lymphedema in my groin since lymph nodes were removed. Can you suggest anything I do? Um, anything I can do? Is that is that common, first of all, David? So pain after a, a vulvectomy is it's not uncommon. Yeah, it does happen. Uh, we, it's a form of surgery is a form of injury to the skin and skin heals. However, nerve ending pain at the site of a scar is not uncommon. Um, it does tend to settle with time. Uh, we sometimes treat nerve ending pain following surgery with pregabalin, gabapentin, amitriptyline, the pain-modifying drugs that we use uh, for amitrip uh, for vulvodynia, those can be considered. Um, the lymphedema, uh, yes, that is tricky, and we would usually get the lymphedema service to assess for a package of care, and that can be massage, support stockings, it can be leg elevation, good skin care. So that it, I'd like to say is treatable. I'm sorry that it's been 2019 now and it's still going on as a problem. That's a couple of years. Yeah, so tricky, but treatable, hopefully. Okay. Um, and in terms of risk, are there certain people that are more at risk? So is there a, a genetic risk? And there's one here, am I more at risk having had SEC as a result of oral lichen planus five times in five years. Um, what's SCC, first of all, David? Yes, so SCC squamous cell carcinoma, that's the commonest type of skin tumour. That's what a pathologist will report on the, on the biopsy. Uh, smaller numbers of vulval cancers are melanomas, where you get pigmentation of the vulva, uh, a change in pig pigmentation like melanoma as you would see on the other parts of the body. So I would say hard to individualize to your personal case, but there is this 95% chance within lichen planus that you won't get a, a squamous cell carcinoma in the vulva and then the 5% chance that you might. So it's, it is, it is well recognized that patients with LP have a slightly increased risk chance of squamous cell cancer. If you've had it in the mouth, a squamous cell cancer in the mouth, I might be, I, we don't have the true answer to this, but I wouldn't suggest that you're, if you're otherwise well, that you're a, a significantly increased risk of chance of getting a squamous cell carcinoma in the vulva. I don't, I, a body of medical opinion, you might call that, might be slightly divided on that, but it, it, it's not logical that you would suddenly have an increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma on the, on the vulva, but it would be an increased, and you would have an, a slightly increased risk like other patients with LS and LP and VIN. Um, I hope that's that's mm. answered your question there. And so in terms of genetic, you know, just genetic. a message about fusion. Um, this I think this 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 fusion of the vulva and there's ongoing sort of care of the vulva in lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, and this is uh, I guess these are other complications of the condition with scarring and splitting and itching and soreness. These are sort of ongoing issues with LSLP, but by nature of those symptoms individually, that these are not potential cancer causing at complications. So fusion is very common, splitting is very common, um, but they're not necessarily a sign that cancer is developing if you've had the checkup. 
there, there, there are issues that run in parallel uh, to the, the, the overall chronic nature of the disease. Yeah. And those of you watching who are concerned about lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, vulval skin conditions, uh, there is a live stream uh, had a few couple of months ago with Dr. Karen Gibbon, vulval dermatologist, uh, which is available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So I would certainly look that up. There was one here about how would I distinguish between genital warts and vulval cancer? Good question. Uh, genital warts are benign skin growths of the uh, of the genital area. So they're, they're, they are they're common. They're, they are well, they are sexually transmitted, and they're due to the human papilloma virus and uh, cancer of the vulva. As you saw in the picture, it uh, looks different. I, I think you personally couldn't inspect the vulva. Uh, and look and say, this is definitely genital warts, or this is, uh, or, or this is definitely vulval cancer. You might get an opinion, uh, a, a, an opinion from. Well, if you think if, if sexual health is likely, for example, if if if, if, sec, if genital warts is likely, you've there's been some sexual contact with someone who's had genital warts, and then you've developed them, then it's highly likely. That they are genital warts um, uh, because they're caused by a virus uh, and skin to skin transmission. Then cancer is, is very unlikely, and often they they can disappear without treatment. So if they if you've developed these little itchy, multiple fleshy skin tags um, that that um, slowly disappear with time, then that's not vulval cancer. If you've got um, if you've got many ulcer, many warty lesions, fleshy, itchy, all over the vulva, um, and following recent contact, then sexual health would be the place to go, GE medicine for treatment, and they'll have a look and they'll be able to tell you co with confidence what the diagnosis is. Cancer of the vulva, it's, it, as you saw in that the, the lip there, um, they don't tend to have lots of multiple fleshy tags. It tends to be one one maybe possibly two areas of, of of rather than itchiness and irritation, itchiness and soreness and, and possibly bleeding and pain. So they do look very different. David, you mentioned itching and someone here is, is talking about the fact that they never experienced itching. It has done, but it's still doing a lot of damage. How do I know when it's in remission? Is the question. Is that the, the vulval cancer? Mm. Or the... Yeah, it just says mine has never really itched, but has done and is still doing a lot of damage. How do I know when it's in remission? So I imagine, Susan, who you've asked this, you've had vulval cancer. We'll wait until um, Susan comes back to us on that. Um, talking about um, VIN, um, there's a question about VIN3 lesions yeah yeah is there any signs we should watch out for that would suggest the lesions are becoming cancerous that's a that's a good question um vin is a it's a real spectrum of, of conditions so many women who have an area of vin and there's a question in the comments about what it is it stands medically for vulval intraepithelial neoplasia uh, which is a precancerous uh, change in the skin. Um, it's a little bit like having CIM, which is precancerous changes on the cervix after an abnormal smear test. It doesn't, uh, it's got a low chance of turning to cancer, 5% um, five, five chance, um, but, uh, and it can cause itching and soreness it diagnosed on a biopsy. So the, the, most of the time it can be it can be asymptomatic or there can be itching as a as a as the commonest symptoms itching or, or sometimes no symptoms um it's if you if you have like a vin and and the doctors have said to you well this is vin there's no real treatment at the moment 
we can suggest surgery or sometimes we use a miquimod which is a it's it, that's like an antiviral cream and you have you live with vin and many women do live with vin and it doesn't progress to something of uh, to progress to a cancer what i would suggest is self-examination might be an idea often speaking to your doctor about the changes and then the, i think the key is back to the, that safe al, um, al, um uh, those the, the, the safe sort of uh, checklist. So the the presence of a lump or a nodule, the, the presence of pain, soreness that doesn't settle, um, and and skin color change. Yeah. So it's it's having that level of vigilance in the skin and, uh, by looking, feeling, and reporting symptoms. Okay. Um something here about any links between vulval cancers and other cancers so you know uterine breast cancer ovarian cancers any estrogen drive in the vulval skin cancers uh, another good question so the squamous cell cancers of the vulva are not um, genetically linked to other cancers uh, in the body, such as breast, ovarian, um, uterine cancer, other gynecological cancers or women's health cancers. Uh, some vulval cancer is due to HPV, that human papilloma virus. So, uh, and so there can be a link to precancerous cells on the cervix. So that would be, that would be a minimum to get a, a, a smear test done. Uh, after the um, after a diagnosis of VIN, we wouldn't necessarily do more smear tests. You just have you just ensure that the cervix that the cervical smear was normal, um, but it's not linked to other cancers in the body, um, it, 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 and it's not linked to family histories. So if, if mum had it or other family members had it, it won't be passed on. Um. Now, I don't know what this stands for. Again, you'll have to uh, help me out here. When I go for a checkup of my vulva, my consultant usually looks at my mouth as I have EOLP also. So erosive oral lichen planus. Yeah, so that's a, so it's a lichen planus of the vulva, what we call erosive lichen planus. It's the, it's the, it's the, the sort of non-identical twin or sister condition of lichen sclerosis, and some women have one or the other or both. Um, if you've got lichen planus of the vulva, which is the, the, the redness, these are this, this is a soreness, uh, burning uh, causes burning when you pass urine. It makes that those that's a common symptom as well as sometimes itching. You have a one in three chance of having it in the mouth, and that's why. The dermatologist usually consultant dermatologist would look in the mouth as well just to see if there's any change there yeah because uh, it could be a, a multi-site skin condition um all right so i don't know if you've spotted any more there that i've missed um that aren't too personal. So there are a few questions in here that are very, very personal that, that we're not gonna ask. We, we're just gonna make it as, as general as possible so, so people can be helped. You can, of course, email us info at vulvalpainsociety.org if you want uh, questions to be answered. Um, we may take a little time, you know, we're all uh, working as well. So, uh, but we'll, we'll get back to you um, if you have particular questions. Uh, let me just have a look if there's any other general ones here. There's a question about how long how how long should you stop using dermophate before going for a biopsy? Um, I think the the the, the rule of uh, the, the the general teaching is if you've got maintenance, if you have lichen sclerosis and you you're, and you you're on a maintenance or lichen planus on a maintenance dose of dermophate, say twice a week, and you you would your symptoms don't settle. Um, and you could develop itching or maybe some uh, an area of soreness then you would or, or flare up your mic for want of a better word that you would use the dermophate daily uh maybe three sometimes four weeks provided you were happy with that daily treatment and then go and see a, a, a medic uh, for a review now if there's something there that's sinister 
like a possible cancer, then the dermavate's not going to impact on what that looks like. So you won't see shrinkage of the tumour with the dermavate. That doesn't happen. But you might see improvement of the skin with the of the lichen with the dermavate. So it's it's not it's possible to biopsy someone who is using regular dermavate if it's needed. Yeah. Okay. And there's a question about the vaccine. Well, the vaccine is the HPV vaccine uh, is available now to schoolgirls, um, and it's embedded in our sort of uh, in vaccination program. It, it's the anti HPV prevents cancer causing what we call H oncogenic HPV infections. Its main aim is to reduce the risk of cervical cancer, deaths from cervical cancer. That's its main objective. But in the initial st studies that were produced, it does also help um, prevent uh, VIN and probably vulval cancer, although that's hard to completely prove. Uh, in terms of it saving lives from vulval cancer, but logically it would it it might go some way to 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 reduce in the incidence of HPV related cancers. Okay, there's a couple more questions here, David, that have just come in. Um, what kind of fusing can be dangerous? Well, fusion is, uh, yeah, fusion is a stickiness of the tissue. It is a complication of LS and LP, not so much VIN. Um, the, the tissue, as it's inflammatory, inflamed, uh, it can fuse together and become sticky uh, and, and, and then scarred. So as such, it's, it's not dangerous to have fusion because uh, it's common in lichen sclerosis. But it's it its big impact is on function. So you know, sex would be the its biggest impact because of splitting with with intercourse. Um, so fusion uh, is not in its by itself dangerous, but it is a sign that maybe the lichen isn't controlled, particularly if there's increasing fusion. So that would suggest that there's nights either needs to be more steroid applied more frequently or a different steroid ointment. So by itself, it's not a sign of cancer or or, or something life threatening. It's a it's a, it's a it's the it's the individual's function and and how it affects the quality of life. Yeah. And there's one final one, perhaps, as we're running short on time. Why can you have a smear that's negative, and skin on the vulva positive? Uh, Positive for HPV, yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, smear test uh, can, the smear test these days test for the HPV virus through the uh, through the laboratory and it'll use a sophisticated way of picking up the, the active virus on a smear test. We don't do smear tests on the vulva for the virus, although you can sometimes get HPV related VIN um, I guess the answer to that might be the fact that the virus uh, may have been cleared from the body. Um, so the cervix has actually uh, cleared the virus from being active. So the virus is negative on the smear test, but the knock-on effects on the vulval skin continue. So the virus is within the cells of the vulva in the precancerous cells and the, and the and the skin is changing through the virus but the active virus is long gone it's sort of almost done it's it's triggered off a process in the skin so the virus tests negative but the virus impact it continues with the skin this precancerous change well that's one school of thought it's not it's not proven but yeah okay um and just really a couple of comments have come in about appointments being cancelled or delayed uh, because of what's been going on in the world over the past year and any thoughts about that you know the the delays that are that are going on uh, to see vulval to see a vulval dermatologist um, any advice you might give people difficult very difficult in 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 the pandemic we we shifted to from face-to-face -face consultations overnight to either clinics being cancelled 
or the face-to-face -face mobile consultations turned into telephone consultations. Mm. We're not quite sure what the knock-on effect of that is, but um, we are, I, I think, speaking to colleagues around the country, we're, we're, we're back to seeing people face-to-face -face now uh, in clinics. And there's actually an opportunity to split the follow-ups from face-to-face -face and then telephone, which can work quite well uh, to have a combination of two. But it's ideally, aspirationally, we'd give people the choice to be seen face-to-face mm -hmm. -face or telephone. Um, uh, sometimes aspirations don't always fall complete, but um, because I guess the big problems are waiting lists. There's a comment that someone's been waiting 12 months to see someone. Very difficult. And um, I think it would be... I, I think I think your, your GP is your first port of call. Generally, um, if a good GP, I would hope. I mean, getting to seeing the GP can be difficult as well. As a minimum standard, you need a history taken and an examination, um, and examined by someone who understands what what they're doing in terms of looking closely. If they can't do that, then the referral needs to be made. It's a it's a really difficult one because across a lot of health care topics we've uh, um, we've still got the same issue of waiting lists okay um so i've noticed we've gone over the hour and uh, a few people have uh, joined late and got a few questions in there i would suggest that you email us info at vulvalpainsociety.org um David Nunns, thank you so much. That was super informative. And I think this is such an important topic. Um, and I ha have in mind that I think perhaps, you know, we need to do another one of these um, and with someone else talking about vulval cancer alongside uh, you, because this is quite a, a, a topic that's really, really important. Um, any final thoughts before we, we go, David? Really, uh, uh, the, the, we are very keen as a health community of dermatologists, gynaecologists, GPs, nurses to support women learning self-examination. And I don't think we can easily do that on our own in busy clinics. If people have got innovative ideas, things that have worked for them, um, techniques, uh, uh, tricks, uh, habits or tips then we need to know about that because we can very easily put that together in some form of, of message that goes out uh, because it's not all right I give this presentation on behalf of some of the women I've seen but it really needs to it's going to be so individual uh, for women to, to to get into the habit but all I would say is a habit routine um, taking that first step probably is very important, particularly when many women are on this once a year follow-up. Uh, I'm seeing it in the chat again. It might be a once a year follow-up. You might be discharged back to the GP for your own fo your own follow-up. So we need to know what, what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, but just try to begin this process and, um, and, and, you know, I'm hopeful that, in a year's time when we all meet again or whenever we do another uh, talk on this topic things will be in a much better place but please have a look at the leaflet um yes. and and see what you think uh, you'll see i've put that link up in the comments uh, a couple of times the bssvd leaflet and you'll also find a link to it on our website bubblepainsociety.org um, and someone a final comment from someone all about knowing your normal. And I think that's that's right, isn't it? It's if we regularly check, then we get to know what our normal is. And if there are changes, then it's keeping an eye on that and then going to see your GP if things don't, don't clear. So for any of you who join the live stream late or you wish to watch again, because there is a lot of information there and I'm glad you shared those slides because that information is there for people to just go and refer back to. Um, this live stream, along with all the other live streams, remain up on our Vulnerable Pain Society Facebook page and on the VPS YouTube channel as well.
Um, and the YouTube channel also has uh, a selection of informative webinars, uh, recordings from last year. Uh, if you're not already doing so, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and that just means you'll be notified of upcoming events. Um, let me tell you quickly about our next live stream, uh, which is on estrogen, vestibular dynia, and the safety of HRT. And that is with Mr. Peter Greenhouse, consultant in sexual health and a menopause specialist. Uh, the date for that, Wednesday, the 23rd of June, 7 p.m. BST. That's all from the VPS for now. Thank you, everyone, for joining us live and those who are watching the live stream. Thank you again, Dr. David Nunns. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sharon, Thank for you. this. Thank you. And bye, everyone, for now. See you next time, Wednesday, the 23rd of June at 7 p.m. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.